We are all on a journey. And there are parts of the journey that we're on that we don't expect things happen. And what I want to talk about today is the blessing is in the mess. Sometimes when we think about our lives, we would like to move in the area where the blessing is, and we don't always realize that the blessings so often come out of trouble, messes. Where, where do you find honey? In the beehive. You put your hand in that beehive and you'll understand something about mess. But that's where the honey is. But it's a metaphor to help us understand the way God works in your life and in my life. There are things out there that seem uncomfortable, but God seems to move in the direction, you'll find this all throughout the Bible, he moves in the direction where trouble is, and then from trouble, he gets involved. And the, the, even the, the beginning, in the beginning, when God created, it says that the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And that is when, when the earth was without form and void, that's when the Spirit of God came and moved on the face of the waters. He moved on the mess. And we could say after he was through, what a beautiful world. Because God can make something beautiful out of things that are messed up. He did it from the very beginning. He's still in the business of doing that. Now, when we come to our text, which is the 13th chapter of Numbers, Moses has sent 12 leaders, one leader from each tribe, to go search out the Holy Land, which wasn't holy at the time, but which is Canaan land, which God said is the promised land, and bring back a report of what the people look like, what the cities look like, and what do you find out there? So the 12, we, we, the scripture talks, that, talks about them as spies. So the 12 spies, well now this is what we read in the 27th verse of the 13th chapter. And they said, after spending 40 days, um, by the way, it was the first Holy Land trip that is recorded. After spending 40 days, they came back and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Now, it starts off so great, and then it goes so bad, because then they started talking about the, the enemy that were living in this place, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the termites in the land. And that soured their attitude because this is what they said. 10 of the spies said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Which is a very strange statement and we'll get to that somewhere in the sermon. We can't go. Uh, they're bigger, they're stronger. They said that they have giants in the land. The land is, is devours, they, they want to paint a pessimistic picture, this is it. The, the land devours its inhabitants and the people are men of great such that they're presenting these people as monsters. And the problem with the 10 spies is that what they saw erased what God said. Sometimes what we see in our circumstances removes what God told us. And that's where trouble comes. There we saw giants, and this is what happens when a person is pessimistic, they tend to be more pessimistic, and they put a spin on things that are not necessarily true, but the spin just makes it a little bit more negative. 
we saw the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our sight. Grasshoppers. But they went one step further. And this is where, you, you know, you could tell where, where a person's coming from when you listen to the slant. When they put a certain spin on, you could tell if they're negative or positive because you can put a positive spin on things. You can put a negative spin. This is the spin that they put on, and we were grasshoppers in their sight. And I'm thinking, did you have an interview with these guys? Did you ask them? How do we look to you? <laughs> it's the spin. And it's the spin that discourages us because once you start getting into that slippery slope and you're going downhill in some discouraging way, you find many more things to discourage yourself with. You add stuff to it. You add stuff that's not even true. Their fear multiplied. And they forgot what God told them. Now we go through the story, and, and you find that it's really interesting. Where did the grapes come from? It's, it, it, it's, it's obvious that the grapes came from the enemy camp. And they brought the grapes. Now remember this, they think they are grasshoppers. But these grasshoppers are bringing the grapes back to Moses. Grasshoppers don't eat grapes. People do. But we can get so messed up, messed up in our thinking that what we might be doing is the right thing, but we're thinking the wrong thing. And this is where their problem lies. They, they saw something that disturbed them to the point where they now doubted that they could do what God said they would get. Grasshoppers. Where does God put peacemakers? He never puts a peacemaker where peace is. What's the purpose? You can't make peace out of peace. You make peace out of trouble. You make peace out of strife. You make peace out of the mess. That's why God calls us peacemakers, because he wants us to get into the mess, and into that mess we need to bring peace, his peace. How do we develop patience? You know, patience is a wonderful thing, and we would all like to be patient people, but how do you develop it? The scripture says you develop patience through tribulation. That means you've got to get in. You know, people that are impatient, you can tell who is impatient. The slightest little thing that happens, they explode. They're not patient. Because you learn patience in tribulation, and you learn how to stay cool when things get hot. That's what God's teaching us. That's what ministry is about. Ministry is about learning how to conduct ourselves with his mind in us and his peace in our heart. And God leads the way. <clears throat> he shows us. He shows us that he can take ashes and turn them into beauty. All over the Bible you find the same thing. The mess <clears throat> in God's hands turns into something beautiful. So well, sometimes <clears throat> we find ourselves in a mess and it discourages us. And I can understand that. But it's the mess that God uses. That's what he's looking for. The messes. Now, what I want to illustrate it this way is that Gideon, we know that Gideon went with 300 men to face the Midianites, who, by the way, were 135,000 men. 300 men against 135,000. When you have odds like that, you know the devil's in the corner, and the devil is saying, do the math, dummy. 300 against 135,000? You're dead where you stand. But the devil doesn't tell you that God is not interested in numbers. In fact, God laughs at numbers. He said, one of you in Psalm 90 will bring down a thousand. 
on one side and 10,000 on the right side. God's not impressed with numbers. God could take the 300 men that Gideon had and bring to naught the 135,000 Midianites that came against him. Because God can step into what looks like a mess to the world and turn around. You know, we're living in a, a very incredible time right now. Any election campaign is usually chaotic. God can take chaos and turn it around because God's still in control. We fail to see that so many times because we are overwhelmed by trouble that comes our way, but the truth never changes. Now, ministry is an interesting thing because in ministry is about, I like, I like when you come into the, the lobby, you're gonna notice it's a high chair, and ministry is really helping people go from infancy to maturity, and it's not easy. Oh, physically, it's automatic, not spiritually. We, we got to learn how to grow up, and it's not easy to grow up because God so often uses the messes that are in our lives to help us become aware of his power and his ability. He takes a mess. When we came to California, when Nancy and I came to California, this is what they told us back east. They said, you know, California is the preacher's graveyard. And I said in my head, well, thank you very much. We're already going. We get to California, and I came, I didn't come to start a church. I came to be an associate pastor, and the first year was incredible. It was great, easy. I know how to do associate pastor work. So easy, follow instructions. That's it. You don't have to plan anything, you just. But a year later, the thing fell apart. And I found myself having to start a church. I never started a church, ever. I never wanted to start a church, it's too much work. But there I am, that's what ministry is, it's a mess. Okay, so now we have to start a church, so how are we gonna do this? And, and we found a building, this building, that was $250,000, but somebody else is already in escrow to turn it into a pussycat theater. That's a mess. But they fell out because they could come up with the down payment, so we were next in line. And I mentioned this before, so we, we told, told the owner, well, we, we only have $5,000. We can't buy your building with $5,000. The bank will not lend us the money because we have no track record and we have no collateral and we're brand new. That's a mess. But God opened up the door because he goes to messes to open up the door. And the owner says, you can take the building for 10 months and not pay any rent and come up with the down payment. So, so God works through the messes. But when you're going through the mess, it doesn't look like the miracle is coming. You, you're in the mess. And when you're in the mess, this, when you're in the mess, this is what you see. You see everything tangled up. You don't see how it's going to roll out. So you have to live in the mess, trusting, believing, having faith in a God that can handle a mess and turn it around into something, and he does. And he will. And he'll do it again in your life, wherever the mess is. That's where God works. But we have the idea in our mind, you know, I, 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 my thinking is mess to bless. Oh, wait a minute. Mess to bless doesn't happen that fast. It's, you got to go from mess to mess to mess before you get to the bless. Let me prove it. We would like this. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam. And a deer and the antelope play. We seldom is heard a discouraging word. It's, that's, that's the kind of life I would like. I like comic book life. And in the skies, 
are not cloudy all day, but we have clouds. We have discouraging words. And when God involves us in ministry of some type, there's always going to be cloudy days and discouragement. It comes with the package. Paul put it this way. He said, I am pressed on every side, but not knocked down. What an incredible statement. While he's pressed on every side, he refuses to be knocked down because he has enough trust in God to get him through the mess. God is good. When God called Abraham, you know, Abraham is the man of faith. Everybody knows Abraham, the man of faith. But I want you to know something about Abraham. When, when, when Abraham was called by God, God told him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And anybody that blesses you, I will bless them. And anybody that curses you, I will curse him. And God gave him this promise. And God has given us a promise. I listened to Nancy Ann uh, during the uh, Bible study on Monday, and she said, I, I, something to the effect, I read the last page and we win. That's true. We read the last book in the Bible, you discover we win. But you can also read the middle of the book and realize you win. Surely, without the shadow of any doubt, surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. Why would, why would David write, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us, follow us, follow You know why? Because we get into trouble and God's got to send goodness and mercy after us because he knows we're in trouble. We, he knows we're in a mess. And so he's sending out the troops, goodness and mercy to take care of us. God's got plans to rescue us from whatever we're in. God told Abraham, you leave your country, you leave your family, come to a land that I will show you and I will bless you and I'll make you a great nation. I'm going to do all these wonderful things. So Abraham leaves. The scripture says he left not knowing where he was going. And God took him to Canaan. When he arrived in Canaan, there was a severe famine. This is the problem that we have. We listen to God, we do what God says, and we are stepping out where God wants us to step. Boom, suddenly, there's a famine. Where did this come from? You promised me to bless me. You promised you to bless those who bless me and curse him that curse him. What is this? Well, I don't understand. The, the, and he backslid. The man of faith. Could that happen? Oh, yes, it can happen. He backslid and he went to Egypt. And God did not leave him. God went after him and God did provide for him and brought him back. But when he had a son... Isaac. Isaac found himself in a famine too, just like Abraham did. But this time, God spoke to Isaac and said, don't do what your father did. Don't go leaving this place where there's a famine. You stay in the famine and I will bless you in the famine. He had to have trust and faith to believe that the mess that he is in, God could get him out. How do you trust God when everybody's farmland is coming up weeds? And Isaac sowed his seed. And the Bible says God gave him 100 fold in the middle of a famine where everybody's partial of land was rotting and drying up. And he has a bumper crop. God, I think, must laugh in heaven when he says, I show you how I can handle it. In the middle of that famine, I must see that your seed grows. Because God is able. We, we can't go by what we see because what we see is the famine. We got to go by what we hear. God said, stay. So we stay. And God will bless us. That's amazing. God is doing just the opposite of what we think should be done. 
Because God loves to step into the messes of our lives and show us, how would you ever know the power of God unless God showed you his power? He shows you his power to the messes that we go through. That's how we discover his power. And life is not simply a climb to the top. Sometimes there's so much failure that goes on. I remember listening to a sermon years ago, and and the priest just said this. Jesus said, behold the lilies of the field, how they grow. I thought about that, (laughs) how they grow. How do they grow? They grow in dirt. where the worms are crawling. Those beautiful lilies grow in dirt. They grow in mud. They grow in the dark. They grow in the cold. They grow in what we would consider a mess. And look and behold the handiwork of God from a mess. That's the God that we serve. He's able. And he wants to do that with you. He wants to do that with me. How he does it is not important. It's faith that opens a door to allow God to do what only God can do. I trust him. I trust him. You know, the best, the best kind of a mind is a positive mind. I mean, we would know that even if we weren't Christians. And the reason is a positive mind just believes. And it's much more interesting to be a believer than to be down in the dumps a doubter. Just stands to reason. And God's working. God's busy. God's uh, God's busy in the messes that we find ourselves in. The woman, Samaria, she she was in a mess. She she was divorced and married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced, married. married. The man she was living with, she was not married to. She came to the well at noon. The women did not come and draw water at noon because it was too hot. But she came at noon. It was the wrong time of the day. But she came at noon because she didn't want to see the icy stares and the glares that the other women in town would be giving her. And so she stayed alone. She was isolated. She felt alone and isolated because of her life. So she came to the well at the wrong time. But it was the right time. But it's the wrong time. The wrong time can be the right time. Because the right time Jesus shows up, he's sitting at the well when she arrives. And Jesus took her in the mess that she was in, and he introduces us in the New Testament to the first woman evangelist who ran back home, left her water pot, ran back home, and told the men. She didn't tell the women because she didn't have a good relationship with them. She told the men, come see a man that told me everything. God takes us where we are. And his timing is always right. He's making something out of our lives. Sometimes we we get discouraged. God, you can't do it. Look at my record. My record is terrible. And God smiles at our record because our record is nothing compared to what he can do. In 18th chapter of Jeremiah, we read the potter took clay, put it on the wheel, spun the wheel, started to form and shape it, and the vessel was broken in the potter's hands. How could that be, Pastor Joe? I love the Lord. I've been saved. How could I be broken in the potter's hands? Oh, (laughs) yeah. We can be broken even while he is shaping and making and molding our lives. 
But what does the potter do? The potter does not discard it because that's what we think God would be doing. You know, you bro you broke in my hand. I don't need you. Go back to the, the clumps of clay that are in the pit and I'll start with a brand new batch. No, he takes the one that's broken. You want to know something about the love of God? He takes what's broken and makes it over again. The God of second chances. He's after us. He doesn't want to let us go. And as broken as we can become, as discouraged, as hurt as we can be, as troubled and in a mess that we can find ourselves in, God still loves us. He's coming after you. He leaves the 90 and 9 to go after that one lost sheep that's stuck on a cliff somewhere because he cares. There, there's no, I don't think there's any story so short in Scripture and so powerful as the one Jesus told about the prodigal son. He finds himself, he goes to the far country, the story's so simple, he goes to the far country because he wants to be independent and he wants to be on his own and he gets his father's inheritance and goes and spends it wild, wild living. And all of his plans for all the wonderful things he was going to do, he ends up in a pig's pen. He's stuck in the pig's pen. He's hungry in the pig's pen. got no robes on. He's in rags in the pig's pen. He's depressed in the pig. You know what the biggest deal is? Not the fact that he was hungry, lost his shoes, his robes were in tatters. And, no, no. The, the reason why he was in such a mess was because he was proud and too embarrassed to go back home to say, Dad, I'm sorry. That is being stuck. Because that's being stuck on the inside. Outside, yeah, his robes were tattered, no shoes, and he's hungry. Yeah, he, he's hungry because, he, he, in fact, it says he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. And, and all that, but the big problem that the prodigal son has, he is obstinate. He's stuck. He's proud. He can't see himself getting up and dragging his body home to face his dad and say, Dad, I'm sorry. But when he came to his senses, that's what we need. That's what we need. We need to come to our senses and realize that this pride stuff got to go. This pride stuff gets me nowhere. Being obstinate and stuck and embarrassed. What is that all about? I just I stay in the same place. For the, I got to change the attitude that I have and I'm going to humble myself and go to my dad and say, and he rehearsed his program, dad, and before he could finish it, he discovers this. Number one, his dad was waiting for him. You know what amazes me about the story? Jesus tells a story, and the dad never left home to find his son. But you would think if the father loved his son so much, he would have gone after his son, but he waits. He waits. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for his son to come to his senses. And when his son comes to his senses, goes back home, he discovers his father welcoming him. Gives him shoes, a robe, a ring on his finger. I'm looking at the story. I'm thinking, you know, it's the simplest story in Scripture. Jesus told a story about the prodigal son. He never got his inheritance back, by the way. You know why? He spent it. But you know what he got? His true inheritance. The shoes on his feet. The robe on his back. The ring on his finger. The fatted calf and the reception they received. That is the inheritance. Sometimes we think of the inheritance in the wrong way. It wasn't that money. You spent it, you lost it. 
It's what you got when you came back home. And that's what God is calling. He's calling people to come on back, come on back. I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. That humility, that humility, that moment when we come to our senses and say, I'm sorry, and I'm willing to face the music when I, and he discovers there's no music other than the playing that was going on during the ceremony, he discovers that his father was welcome, waiting for him to come and welcomed him when he came. Oh, that is our inheritance. There is a crown of righteousness waiting for us when we get there. We see in the scripture it says that, that, that when we get there, we will have spotless robes. And we wonder about that because said, well, my robes are not spotless. There's spots all over them. I look like a leopard. But when I get to heaven, God's not going to see that. He's going to see his son in me and the welcome comes because I came to my senses and came to him henceforth there is for me a, an everlasting welcome God's looking for us we're so sometimes we're so focused on the mess that we're in we can't see the miracle that God has God uses it. There's a problem in this story. Big problem. The problem is this. When the 12 spies went to the Holy Land, the Canaan land, one year before they went, 365 days before, they watched, they were eyewitnesses, they were there when God brought Pharaoh, the man who was in charge of the mightiest kingdom on earth, down to his knees with ten plagues. And they're afraid. What did they do, forget? Did they, did they forget that a year before God miraculously rescued them not only rescued them when they got to the Red Sea just a year ago not only that but when they got to the Red Sea it divided their God and Pharaoh and his army drowned in that Red Sea and in the morning there was a white cloud that was leading them and in the evening there was a, a pillar of fire that was watching over them and keeping them warm and in the morning there was manna being poured out for all year long manna falling from heaven and, and water coming out of the rocks and now they're telling us we can't get into this land that God promised us and we have a record, we have a past that tells us one thing about God, he can get us through anything we go through he can turn the world upside down and he did, and they forgot because of fear, and because of doubt. God's got the track record. They knew it, but doubt and fear overcame what they knew. And the question for us is simply this, can God do it again? Yes, he can, he'll do it again. He'll do that. If God be for us, who can be against us? Lord, show us again. You can do it. You will do it. You're doing it. We just need to see it. Because our eyes are too focused on the stuff that's falling down. Our eyes are too focused on the media that's scaring us half to death. It's got so, I don't even want to watch the news anymore. I know you need to know what's going on. So I find out what's going on by looking at the bullet points. I don't want to listen to this commentator tell me over and over again in a hundred different ways how terrible, I don't need to hear that. Tell me how wonderful God is. I'm gonna find out. Because God's gonna take those terrible things and turn them around. That's what he does. Do it again, Lord, do it again. We are a nation that needs you to do it again. Again, you can, you will. That's who you are. There's one thing I do admire, and it's Israel. 
They're willing to take their battle on any front that comes. They don't care who that person is. You want to fight us? We will bring you down. And you know, and you know why? I, I don't know. I think, I, th- I think the reason is that the Jews are, are so determined to, to bring the, the battle to the enemy is because somehow they know in their DNA that God told Abraham, I will bless you, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse him who curses you. And the promise that God made 4,000 years ago is still true today. It's not going to change. God doesn't change his mind. He's there. And here he is, standing before us, telling us, I'm the same God. I'm still with you. Oh, yes, you failed. Of course you failed. You think that surprised me? But I never left you. And when you were broken, I put you back together again. And I'll do it again and again and again. Don't stray. I'll do it again. I, I had a fellow one time who was so upset about the fact that he couldn't break the cigarette habit. And he finally, he told me, this was back east, he told me, he says, I give up. I'm tired of being discouraged. I said, this, don't give up. That's what the devil wants you to do. Give up. That's what the 10 spies wanted to do, give up. But Joshua and Caleb, they had such an attitude. They saw the same things that the 10 spies saw. And they ended up saying, we are well able to overcome them. Don't give up. Giving up means to cave in. You don't give up. Marriages are held together because people don't give up. Lives are transformed because people don't give up. Because God is able. We're going to sing a song, Make Me a Blessing. And I want you to think of it this way. Make me a blessing. Lord, I know you can bless me in the mess that I'm in. I know that because I heard that. It's all over the scripture. Would you help me to become a blessing to somebody who's in a mess? It's my job. You raised us up. You raise us up to be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. And so, Lord, my prayer is make me a blessing out of my life. Let Jesus shine. And it's not really difficult. It's not difficult to let Jesus shine. It's not difficult for the sun to shine. Shine, the bright light makes no noise. Just be. Just be. And that's what Jesus wants to make us, just to be a blessing. As we sing this chorus, this altar is open. I'll be glad to pray with you as we sing it. Make me a blessing. Lord, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine.